Hello, everybody, and welcome to AISC's live webinar on facade attachments. Today's webinar is being presented by Alec Zimmer of Simpson, Gumperts, and Heger. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to thank you for joining us, and I hope you find today's presentation a valuable one for future reference. And with that, I want to introduce today's speaker, Alec S. Zimmer, PE, SE, CB, and Lead AP. Alec is a senior project manager at Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager in their Waltham, Massachusetts office. He has been with the firm since 1998. As a member of SGH's structural design group, he designs new building structures and investigates and rehabilitates existing buildings. Zimmer worked extensively with James Parker to develop the AISC Design Guide 22, Facade Attachments to Steel Frame Buildings. Following the Design Guide's publication, he and Parker presented a seminar on behalf of ASC on the same subject in numerous cities around the U.S. Please uh, welcome Alex Zimmer. Alec, you can take it from here, sir. Thanks, Brent, for that very nice introduction, and uh, thank you to all of you listening in today. Um, as Brent mentioned, I'm a senior project manager in uh, SGH's Boston area office, and in my day-to-day -day work, I spend most of my time designing new building structures and investigating buildings that have uh, some way failed to meet expectation. And one important component of my work as a new designer is to figure out how the facade is going to be supported on the buildings that I design, even if I'm not directly responsible for the system's structural design and performance. It's a very challenging part of structural design work for me, and I find it often takes a disproportionately large amount of my time to get it coordinated and, and get it right to the satisfaction of the, the owner and the architect. Um, so I hope you'll find that today's webinar is, is informative, and I hope that it raises your awareness of some of the technical issues involved and the importance of defining the roles and responsibilities uh, that are incumbent upon these designs. So I'm not really here to prescribe a specific set of details for supporting facades, but it's my hope that you'll be able to apply what you learn here in a way that benefits uh, your own projects. As Brent mentioned, um, uh, AISC's Design Guide 22 was written by James Parker, uh, who is a senior principal in our Los Angeles office. And uh, you can download that design guide from AISC's website. And I worked with James developing much of the content for the design guide uh, we toured the country and did a number of presentations like this, a uh, four-hour presentation, and today's 90-minute presentation is a condensation of that much longer talk. So for that reason, we'll have uh, time just to cover some of the highlights of the design guide, and I'll point you to the places uh, where the design guide goes into greater depth. Through Design Guide 22, AISC is trying to raise awareness of the issues of attaching facades to steel frame buildings and trying to make sure that we have much more successful projects. So today we're going to use the design guide as our template uh, for some of our discussion, highlighting uh, some of portions of most of the chapters and going into greater depth on others. The main objectives of the design guide are to assist the practicing engineer in achieving slab edge and spandrel beam details for the steel frame that are going to be structurally sound, they're going to be durable, they're going to be economical, and they're, they're going to accommodate the various requirements of the facade system. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, the design guide includes a number of design aids that we hope you'll find useful, uh, such as designing a bent plate pour stop or designing shelf angles that support a brick veneer. The design guide also has a number of uh, detailed example problems. And today, because of the limited nature of the time we have for the presentation, we won't take the time to go through the uh, design examples, but be aware that they're in the design guide for your reference and uh, hope you'll find them useful. So today's agenda. The first thing we're going to do is talk about the fundamentals of facade performance. We'll talk about the importance of establishing design criteria and what those criteria are and where to find them. We'll talk about the importance of establishing roles and responsibilities for those involved in designing and assembling and erecting the facade system. We'll talk about tolerances of not only materials but also construction tolerances and things to consider uh, in our design. We'll talk about slab edges and some criteria for designing them as well as spandrel beams. 
And then we'll move on to talking specifically about masonry veneer and, if time allows, several other wall systems. Um, in this case, uh, I think given our 90, short 90 minutes here, we probably won't have time to talk about many of the other wall systems, but if time allows, we'll, we'll forge ahead. There are three key takeaways that I want you to have as, you, uh, as we leave the webinar today. The first is that the design team needs to develop a strategy uh, for the facade attachment. And the SER, the Structural Engineer of Record, has an important role in developing that attachment strategy. The second is that ASCE 7 and the International Building Code have explicit criteria for facade attachments. And that's especially true for seismic considerations. The third is that facade attachment strategy that's chosen by the design team is going to have a fairly significant effect on the design of the building's slab edges and its spandrel beams. So let's dive right into talking about the fundamentals of facade performance. The building envelope is going to enclose the building and it'll, it's going to control the transmission of air, water, heat, sound, and light both into and out of the building. It doesn't just make the building look pretty. It's a very functional part of the building. And the envelope consists of a number of components. It's the roofing, it's the windows, it's the walls, the doors, even the foundation walls, and the interfaces between all of these systems. In terms of how facade systems perform, there are essentially three different types. There's a reservoir system, an older type of system, which really depended upon the thickness of the masonry to prevent water, inf significant water infiltration into the building. So these heavy masonry systems were kind of like a sponge, wetting and drying with atmospheric moisture and with exposure to rain and snow. More recently, we've developed barrier types of systems, which were dependent upon the imperviousness or relative imperviousness of the facade material and the sealant joints between those facade panels to prevent water from infiltrating into the building. We've also recently developed cavity types of systems which have perhaps a pervious uh, veneer on the face of the building and then a waterproof membrane behind that veneer that directs any water that gets through the, the uh, veneer back to the outside of the building. So it's kind of fun to take a quick look at the timeline of enclosure walls. We've got a very long history of load-bearing masonry, so that, uh, that sponge-type system wetting and drying with atmospheric moisture, a relatively short period that we call transitional masonry buildings, and then starting from about the mid-20th century on, contemporary curtain walls. Obviously, load-bearing masonry goes back a long way, and it's still used today in certain situations. Following that, we had a, a, a period that I guess we call transitional masonry. And in these buildings, such as you see here in these photographs, sort of late 19th century to mid 20th century buildings, the steel frame was built integrally with the exterior masonry cladding. There was really no means for the uh, masonry facade to displace independently of the building frame. And the, as the masonry changes volume uh, with moisture and temperature, it's going to attempt to move relative to that frame. And over time, as that masonry tries to change volume, this is going to take its toll on the building. You'll see bulging and cracking, as you see in, in these photographs here. The other problem with transitional masonry buildings is that at least from a water management standpoint, they behave essentially like a reservoir system. The masonry traps moisture in it, and that moisture migrates its way to the steel frame, which is probably not very well protected. That frame is going to rust, and the rust will occupy a larger volume than the steel that it, that it replaces, which causes the walls to bulge and the masonry to spall. So these building systems didn't work out very well. And that really led to the development of the cur modern curtain wall system in the mid-20th century. The primary features of a contemporary curtain wall are a skin, a watertight skin, and a frame behind that which is protected from moisture. And that frame is able to displace relative to the, uh, the skin. So we, we accommodate differential movement between the frame and the skin. We'll be talking more about this as we go through today's presentation. <coughs> 
I just want to point out some uh, primary features of an exterior uh, contemporary curtain wall system. This is a very generic illustration, but I think it gets the point across. There's some sort of exterior panel system, and that could be glass, it could be masonry. We call that the cladding. That cladding is panelized with joints between the individual panels. Behind the panels, there's an insulation system, and behind that, a water barrier or air barrier system. Behind that, toward the interior structure, and then an interior finish system of some sort. So in some systems, like precast panel systems, one component can serve in several roles. So in the precast panel system, the panel acts as the cladding, it acts as the structure, and it acts as the water barrier. There are a number of concepts for control of water infiltration into a building uh, in modern curtain wall systems. There are barrier walls, internal drainage plane systems, cavity wall systems, and pressure equalized rain screens. Uh, in light of the time that we have today, I'm not going to go through these. The design guide goes through them in much more detail. So I just want to skip ahead and talk about the problems that are associated with uh, supporting uh, wall, uh, facades on steel frame buildings and why this is becoming a problem. Quite often we have anchors or support clips for the facade that interrupt the waterproofing or the, uh, the flashing. And uh, during construction, the flashing or water barrier can get damaged around those clips and often not be repaired. Uh, the way anchors are situated within the wall may cause conditions of poor drainage, and that can lead to problems as well. You can also have problems where anchors are not stiff enough to prevent differential movement um, and that movement can then tear the waterproofing barrier and lead to leaks within the building. And of course, at the, the uh, facade, a whole host of trades come together. Here we're dealing with not only the designer, but the steel erector, perhaps the specialty waterproofing contractor, and the uh, contractor responsible for assembling this facade on the building. So there's a host of constructability and coordination of trade issues that come together where the facade meets the building frame. When we think about the uh, general design criteria for a facade system, the first and foremost thing we need to think about is its structural integrity. We also need to provide provisions for movement between the building frame and the facade, and we also need to consider envelope performance, and by this I mean the water tightness and thermal performance of the building. So we've talked a little bit about structural integrity, and we'll keep talking about that. We need to accommodate movement, we need to make sure that our attachment is durable and uh, because that attachment is not going to be repaired frequently over the life of the building. We also need to make sure that we've accounted for potential tolerances uh, in the thicknesses of our panels and the location of our steel frame and that we've provided appropriate clearances to deal with those. We also need to think about constructability. How easy is it going to be to erect the cladding on the outside of the building, and of course, economy, we need to keep in mind always. In terms of structural integrity, it's really achieving a balancing act of redundancy, ductility, and strength. And achieving that balance can be tricky. For example, it's often desirable to support a panelized facade at only two points for gravity load. But by supporting at only two points, it makes redundancy nearly impossible. Additionally, we need to make sure that our anchors are ductile. What happens if they're not? Well, in that situation, the designer could achieve some confidence in the design and the structural integrity of the design by specifying a very high factor of safety on strength and specifying greater quality assurance uh, through a program of uh, inspections and testing of those facade attachments. So again, it's finding some balance between these three things, ductility, strength, and redundancy of the connections. Typically, the gravity loads in the facade are, are going to be the, uh, the dead load of the facade system itself. But uh, watch out for facades that have projections from them. It's very possible that you could have building maintenance operations going on, and you could have workers walking on the projections from the facades. So we need to take those into consideration. Uh, usually, the structural engineer record needs to make some sort of estimate of the uh, weight of the facade before design, but quite often the uh, 
facade system isn't fully detailed at the time the structural designer is in the process of designing the building frame. So in those cases, some conservatism is probably warranted in the loads that we consider for the facade system. Both ASCE 7 and AISC's Manual of Steel Construction give some weights for building facade materials. And uh, Table 2.1 of the design guide uh, gives some other common uh, facade assembly loads. So these are here for your reference. I won't spend the time going through them today. In fact, you'll see this uh, facade attachments uh, logo appear throughout the presentation today. And that's just indicating that you can go and look in the design guide for, uh, for more information from where that slide is derived. I can't think of a good example where the facade load is not eccentric to the building column lines or to the spandrel beams. There really aren't many that I can think of. Usually the facade load, whatever it is, whether it's curtain wall or a precast panel, is set well out from the uh, spandrel beam. So let's take, for example, the picture that you see here on the right of a precast panel that's supported off of the slab edges. Let's zoom in on that. So here you can see that the uh, panel load is down. It has a load FV. And that panel uh, gravity load is going to be supported at the lower slab. Here you can see a red arrow pointing up. But there's also a horizontal component to that uh, gravity load from the panel, which is equal to distance between where the panel is supported and the panel centroid divided by the height. So you get a horizontal load that's associated with gravity loads in this particular case. When we zoom in a little bit and look at the slab edge for the lower slab, we need to think about how that panel actually gets supported. Well, in this case, perhaps the designer assumes the panel is supported directly on the slab and that the panel has a rigid bracket on the back of it. And there's a hinge point at the bottom side of the bracket uh, so that the uh, eccentricity between the spandrel beam and where the hinge is located is this eccentricity ES that you see here. And the eccentricity that one would have to design the panel for is EF, which you see here. So obviously we're going to design the spandrel beam for FV times ES, and the spandrel beam has to resist that torsion unless we take that torsion out by using kickers or a roll beam, and we'll talk more about that. And the panel has to get designed for this moment of EF times VF. But what happens if the panel designer assumes a different location for the hinge. If the panel designer assumes there's a hinge on the back at the side of the panel, then the eccentricity of the panel has to be designed for is much smaller. And the eccentricity of the slab edge has to be designed for remains the same, but there's a concentrated moment on the edge of the slab as well that the spandrel beam has to uh, be designed for. So these are important things to keep in mind, and it's one important reason why there needs to be clear communication between all involved in the facade design process. I won't spend a lot of time talking today about wind loads. Um, that could be and probably is a subject worthy of a four-hour presentation or maybe even a day's discussion. One thing that I will point out is that when we're designing components uh, of the facade for the components and cladding pressures we find in ASCE 7, the International Building Code permits the designer to use a reduction factor of 0.7 when looking at wind load deflections. Now, you're not allowed to do that when you're looking at strength considerations, but when you're looking at serviceability things like deflections, you're allowed to reduce your wind loads by 30%. I'll also point out that where the size of a building project can justify the expense of a wind tunnel study, uh, that study results often indicate that uh, design pressures are lower than those prescribed by ASC 7. And this can lead to a reduction in the cost of the cladding and can also lead to a reduction in the overall design force on the building's main wind force resisting system. One more thing to point out, uh, going back to our precast panel example, is that negative pressures on our cladding can combine with gravity load eccentricities and that combination of gravity and suction load on the facade can often control the attachment design. So pointing out here at the top of this panel, we have an inward uh, reaction force that we need to deal with from gravity loads and we also have a wind force that we need to deal with. 
at the same point, and those two forces add. It's important to realize that for seismic uh, performance, we need to consider the seismic forces, the relative displacements between panels themselves and between the panels and the building frame, and we also need to consider the ductility of the system. The IBC is now very explicit on facade requirements, and uh, we're going to talk here a little bit about that. The main point of the codes is not necessarily to make sure that the facade is going to be undamaged after an earthquake, but to provide a facade that protects life safety uh, by not allowing the facade to fall from the building. As I mentioned, the codes are now more explicit on how one should design facade attachments than they once were. So, for example, in ASCE 7, we have this table uh, which highlights the requirements. And so notice that there are different requirements for the attachments uh, than for the uh, components themselves. We won't go through most of the slides that reference ASCE 7 today, but they're in your handouts for reference. And one thing that I will point out is that ASCE 7 section 13.1.4 exempts uh, buildings that are in seismic design categories B uh, from these requirements. Now that may not be true where you are. I know in Massachusetts, I think they extend the facade attachment requirements down to seismic design category B. But if you're using straight up IBC, you're probably exempt if you're in seismic design category C unless your local code uh, makes it a, a modification to IBC. We're going to skip over this slide and uh, point out that you do have to design the, uh, for the effects of relative displacements between floors of the building and how those affect the facade. There are also some requirements that are specific to attachment types. For example, friction clips are not to be used for the anchorage of the facade. So keep those in mind. Here's some more uh, facade uh, provisions for seismic loads. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides here. You can read these on your own. What I really want to focus on is the loads for which we have to design facades. These are on slide 50, uh, 57. This is the equation we get from ASC 7 for designing not only the wall element itself, whether that's the curtain wall or a uh, masonry veneer system, but also deals with the fastening of that system to the base building structure. This equation probably looks very familiar to most of you who use the equivalent lateral force procedure. Here we have a, uh, a seismic amplification factor, A. We also have an RP factor, which is very much like the uh, factor we use in the equivalent lateral force procedure. It's really a ductility factor. And this equation assumes that the panel is relatively more ductile than the connectors. Now, why do I say that? Well, we end up designing the, uh, the connection system with an RP value of 1 and an AP of 1.5, whereas we design the wall panel itself for an AP of 1 and an RP of 2.5. So the effect of that really is to end up designing the connection system for a load that's more than three times what we designed the wall element for. So the code wants to make sure that you have adequate strength in your connection. If you have adequate ductility, well, that's very well, all, all very well and good. But having strength here is, is more important. Uh, and they, they don't know what kind of ductility your connection system has. So they compensate for that by uh, increasing the load that one has to design the connection for. I'm just going to skip through the next few slides. These are really things that you can find in ASC 7 on your own, so I won't belabor the point. So when we're talking about accommodating relative movement, we need to think about how the spandrel beam deflects both vertically and out of plane. We need to think about how the spandrel might rotate when it's subject to the facade loads. In tall buildings, we need to consider the effects of column shortening. Uh, we need to consider how the brackets might deflect. We need to think about interstory drift between the floors due to wind and seismic load. We need to think about the effects of how the, the facade is going to perform under temperature changes how that facade is going to react under moisture changes. In terms of accommodating relative movement, uh, 
where you locate the joints in the facade system is going to determine how much those joints actually move. So if you compare the top figure, which has one joint between two panels, you see that as that spandrel beam deflects, the joint has to open much more at the bottom than it does when you have two joints in the panel system, and you have relatively smaller movements between panels. Something to keep in mind. And in that case, perhaps a lighter, less stiff beam might be adequate to support what are essentially the same facade loads. The rules of thumb for limiting deflections such as L over 360 or L over 600 for brick are generally thought of as, as protecting the facade from cracking. But controlling the joint movement based on the compressibility of the sealant may actually be more critical. It really depends upon uh, how much compressibility the joint sealants can take and how often the owner is willing to do maintenance on them. So let's take the uh, example of a brick veneer system with soft joints between the relieving angle and the brick below. In this case, let's say that we started with a three-quarter inch soft joint, and I'll just add as a side note, if you can get an architect to go for a three-quarter inch soft joint in your building, you're doing pretty well. You should consider a career as a negotiator as well. So in this system, you've started out with a three-quarter inch soft joint, and that soft joint has a compressibility of 33%, which we're going to denote M. So you can compress the joint by a quarter of an inch before you fail the sealant, or you, you permanently damage the sealant. So let's say that between here and below it, we have total and moisture movement of a total of an eighth of an inch. So that's going to reduce the amount of structure we can accommodate to one quarter minus an eighth, which leaves you an eighth of an inch for uh, for uh, total of eighth of an inch for structural movement. So let's say that this is a serviceability consideration. It's not really a strength one. If we damage the sealant, uh, it's not really a strength consideration. Brent is indicating to me that uh, we're having some problems with my audio. Brent, is that better? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think it's, it's done with, but um, it, it might be worth it to, to go back to the top of this slide. Okay. I'll start here at the top of the slide. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate it. So we're taking, in this case, the example of a brick veneer facade with uh, soft joints at the brick relieving angle locations, just below the brick relieving angle locations. Let's say that we started out with a soft joint width that was 3 quarters inch. And let's say the, the sealant in that joint had a uh, compressibility, a maximum compressibility of 33%. So we can compress the joint by a quarter of an inch before we damage the sealant. Now let's say that between the lower relieving angle and the uh, sealant joint up here, we have a total uh, of thermal and moisture movement of an eighth of an inch. That leaves us uh, a quarter of an inch minus an eighth of an inch equals one eighth of an inch for structural movement. Now this is really a serviceability consideration. It's not a strength one. So let's say that for the purposes of designing the sealant joint, we design that sealant joint for 50% of the live load. So under 50% live load deflection, that's an eighth of an inch. So for 100% live load, that'd be a quarter of an inch deflection. Well, even a quarter of an inch deflection on a 20-foot span is L over 960. For a 30-foot span, it's L over 1440, which is a lot smaller than ACI 530 would tell us we have to consider when we're designing our brick to prevent it from cracking. Food for thought. And again, the reason that we're designing for these movements is so that we don't end up with facades that look like this with sealant protruding from the joint. In this case, the joint was probably too small to begin with, and as the brick changed volume with moisture and temperature, it compressed the sealant and caused the sealant to bulge out of the joint. I mentioned before that we need to be able to accommodate interstory lateral drifts from wind and seismic loads. Although it's not a code requirement in our office, we usually use H over 400 or H over 500 for the uh, maximum interstory wind deflection. For seismic deflections, under inelastic conditions, the code allows us to go perhaps as much as 10 times the elastic wind drifts. So you can see that you may have to design your inelastic drifts for uh, a lot more than you have to design your wind for. 
Now, one thing to point out here is that seismic is really a life safety issue, not a long-term serviceability issue. So we don't particularly care if the joints get damaged in an earthquake. We do care if they get damaged in a wind event, which is much more common. In addition to considering deformations in the plane of the wall, we need to think about how the uh, facade accommodates interstory deflections in and out of the plane of the wall. And these are some examples, and the design guide goes into much more discussion about how these types of interstory deflections are accommodated. And we account for in-plane drifts. Uh, it's usually most easily accounted for by having the facade elements move with the floor supporting them and accommodating horizontal movement, say slip, along the horizontal joints between the floor. So in this upper image, we're accommodating slip here in this, uh, this joint between the two facade panels. Notice that the panel layout can complicate how the interstory drift is accommodated. So if we have for example, in figure D in the lower right, column covers and then spandrel panels between the column covers, we end up with joints that have to open as the frame racks in one direction, as well as close. And in the case, as you see here, as the panel tries to come together, we may actually end up crushing the panel as the uh, building frame tries to sway to the right. When we crush panels, we, rush, we run the risk of the panels being damaged and portions of the panels falling uh, onto the ground below, potentially uh, representing a, a hazard to people trying to evacuate the building in an earthquake. Something to keep in mind. Interstory drift at uh, corner conditions is always tough. There's seldom an easy solution. In this case, the designer needs to consider movement of the building structure in two directions and how the joint near the corner can accommodate that movement. So an in-plane uh, drift in one direction is really an out-of-plane drift in the other direction and vice versa. So we may need to provide an L-shaped corner panel that is attached directly to the column and then provide very large joints adjacent to that to accommodate the associated drifts. One more slide for dealing with uh, lateral deformations and I just want to point out to you that in terms of uh, shear deformations of our lateral system, and those shear deformations are likely to cause more distress on the joints than flexural deformations of the building frame, which cause typically sort of a rigid body rotation of the facade system with less opening and closing of the joints. In terms of limited states, the codes prescribe that we design for safety with a 50-year return recurrence interval for wind and a 475-year recurrence interval for seismic loads. And the facade attachments must safely accommodate the forces in both of these cases and really prevent hazardous damage from falling onto the streets below. But for serviceability checks, like things like wind drift, we may be able to accommodate a lower force and accept more frequent damage to the sealants between those panels. And the design, design guide has more extensive commentary on this issue. We'll talk a bit more about tolerances and clearances coming up. But before we move on, let's just establish a couple of uh, good definitions. The first of which is tolerances. Tolerances are the permissible amount of deviation from a specified criteria, like a dimension, such as the thickness of a panel, or the, uh, the bow of a panel, or the location of a column or a spandrel beam. And clearances are those spaces that we purposefully provide between two parts to allow for differential movement to accommodate tolerances and to provide access during construction. And we'll get to much more of this coming up. Durability of the attachment is of course very important because attachments are going to be difficult to inspect once they're in service. So as designers we need to consider what happens if the wall leaks and what effect that water accumulating on the attachments might have to the structural capacity of the attachment. We need to pay special attention to thin parts and steel fasteners that may not necessarily be protected. Um, water can pool on very thin steel parts like steel studs or corrugated brick ties. So there's a good reason why we don't use corrugated brick ties anymore because they're a good water trap. Last but not least are constructability and economy. And here there's, there's really no right answer. 
sometimes designers intentionally or maybe inadvertently sacrifice constructability or economy over other design considerations like strength or adjustability. So what might be economical in one project in a particular region of the country might not be doable on another project with a different contractor in a different part of the country. So trying to guess exactly what's going to be right for your project can be sometimes like building a better mousetrap. You know, we can, we can always come up with a better solution, but it may not always be the cheapest and best solution. So we need to be conscious that what we don't design is like the better mousetrap that you see on the right. who design the facades and their attachments to the building structure. We should uh, establish a couple of definitions. Um, for the purposes of this talk and the design guide, the SER, the Structural Engineer Record, is that entity that is responsible for the professional design responsibility of the structural uh, system, the primary building structure. The specialty structural engineer is the design professional responsible for the structural design of the facade and or the facade's attachments to the base building structure. And these definitions are generally consistent with AISC's code of standard practice. So quite often the design of the facade elements and their attachments are really not within the scope of services the structural engineer is responsible for. The structural engineer is typically responsible for the building frame. Yet it's within the structural engineer of records uh, best interest to understand the facade attachment system and the strategy for attachment to the, the primary building structure. As a designer of building structures, I always make sure that I understand how that facade is going to be attached make sure I know where it's going to be attached and have a good idea of what loads are going to be applied to my base building structure. And when the shop drawings come for that facade system, whether it's a precast panel or an aluminum glass curtain wall, I take good care to review those, make sure I understand the loads that were used to generate the uh, facade system design and the attachment loads. The performance of the specified elements, including the attachments, is going to be typically de delegated to a specialty structural engineer working for the contractor. One obvious ex exception to that might be a brick veneer system, and we'll talk more about that later. The specialty structural engineer, particularly for something like an aluminum glass curtain wall, might not become involved until after the structural steel frame is designed, fabricated, and possibly even erected. So it's important to have good criteria on your construction documents that indicate what you anticipate uh, the specialty structural engineer will need to design the facade system. As structural engineers of record, we need to provide the anticipated structural movements, whether that's the deflection of the spandrel beams or the interstory drift between stories of the building. We also need to make sure that we design the frame and the slab edge in a way that's consistent with the attachment strategy. The facade support strategy really needs to be sensitive to the effects of the facade on the steel frame. So let's take a couple minutes to walk through a couple of sort of generic uh, facade systems. <coughs> Here you see uh, a uh, masonry veneer example, and we're going to talk about who's responsible for specifying and designing each of the components. So in this system, the architect will typically specify what kind of brick goes on the outside of the building and what kind of brick ties that you see here are going to be used, and they'll perform and specify the backup system. In this case, we're showing a light gauge steel backup, but that could just as easily be a CME backup system. And the specialty structural engineer hired by the contractor will be responsible for the design of that backup system. As the structural engineer of record, we would be responsible for designing the building slab, spandrel beam, kickers or roll beams that brace the spandrel beam, perhaps a hanger that comes down here and supports uh, 
relieving angle, and we designed the relieving angle and a plate on the back of the relieving angle to hold any uh, of the backup system that's above the relieving angle. So here in this example, this structural engineer of record is really responsible for the structural design of most of the components with the exception of the backup system. In the example of a story tall precast concrete panel, the architect will perform and specify the panel itself, provide loads, and the specialty structural engineer uh, designing, who's uh, working for the contractor, will be responsible for designing that panel and its attachments to the base building structure. So this bracket and also this tieback connection will be the responsibility of the specialty structural engineer. And the structural engineer record will then be responsible for designing the base building structure to accommodate the gravity loads of the floor slab, obviously, but as well as the loads from the panel system. In the case of a column-supported precast concrete panel, again, the architect will perform and specify the panel itself as well as its connections and where those connections might be. The specialty structural engineer will design those connections, and the structural engineer of record will be responsible for providing a structural system capable of withstanding the loads uh, imparted by the precast panel system. In the case of an aluminum glass curtain wall, a specialty structural engineer will design the mullions and will design the attachments to the base building structure and the structural engineer of record will need, may need to provide some sort of attachment point for those uh, brackets that hold the curtain wall onto the building frame. So in summary, communicate. The facade attachments are difficult precisely because every member of the design team has a significant stake in the planning, designing, and coordination of these systems and their attachments. I can't stress that enough. It's important to have open communication throughout design and during construction administration too to make sure that uh, the facade systems were designed in accordance with our expectations as members of the design team. Accommodating construction tolerances and clearances. We already talked a little bit about this, but we need to provide adjustability between our connections to make sure that we can accommodate tolerances. As we've already said, the tolerances are the permissible amount of deviation from a specified criterion, uh, such as the uh, camber or plumbness, when we're talking about clearances, we're talking about spaces that we purposefully provide in the building to allow for movement, to accommodate tolerances, and to provide access during erection and assembly. There are essentially three different types of tolerances. There are material production tolerances, such as you might find in the sweep of a beam, or the allowable deviation thickness of an architectural panel. The Application and assembly tolerances, uh, such as the variations of sub-assemblies of facade systems, such as you might find in a prefabricated panel that includes, say, both EFs and the steel truss behind it. And there are erection and inst installation tolerances, such as the plumbness and location of the column and plan. So these three tolerance uh, types of tolerances are aggregated together into an accumulated tolerance. And these accumulated tolerances are what we need to consider in our design. So let's take the example of a uh, precast uh, concrete spandrel panel that's supported from columns at the 10th story of the building. The columns are 40 feet apart. The columns, uh, according to AISC's code of standard practice, <clears throat> have a permissible out of plumbness uh, at the uh, tenth story of two inches in toward the building, so moving to this side, or one inch out of the building, moving on this side. The steel spandrel beam that spans between the columns has a permissible sweep of plus or minus half an inch. And uh, the precast panel location, according to the PCI uh, Design Handbook 6th edition, can be located plus or minus half an inch in toward the building or away from the building and is allowed to bow L over 360 or 1.33 inches between supports. So, so looking in plan, we're concerned about how much gap we might have here between the column and the back side of the panel and here at mid-span between the spandrel beam and the back side of the panel. 
<clears throat> so if we allow for the maximum change in the planned gaps to using the maximum of all the tolerances at the columns, we could have that gap open by two and a half inches, or it could close one and a half inches. So it would close one and a half inches if the column leaned out and the panel were pushed in. At mid-span, we need to consider the column tolerances as well as the sweep of the, uh, of the spandrel beam plus the bowing of the panel. So we can get plus or minus 4.33 to 3.33 inches at the mid-span between the back side of the panel and the spandrel beam. It's unlikely to, that each component is going to deviate by the maximum allowed amount in a way that they would all act together, a perfect storm of tolerances, if you will. The problem really is understanding how the deviations aggregate and how much clearance we need to provide. And that's really something of a guess. There's no good statistical data on how all of these tolerances are going to aggregate. So if I were sitting in your seats this afternoon, I'd be saying to myself, well, this is all very nice and good, but how the heck can I do this in my own project? How do I account for this? And unfortunately, I, I can't give you an easy bulletproof answer. What I can suggest, however, is that you understand the sources of the variability, that you understand the consequences of exceeding the tolerances uh, that we provide, and that we account for, and that we understand the costs of, uh, associated with providing additional uh, clearance. In other words, providing extra long slotted holes or using uh, a field welded connection in lieu of a bolted one. So for each project, at the beginning of the project, the whole design team, architect, structural engineer, and building envelope consultant, if there is one, should develop a design criteria for addressing facade accumulated tolerances and make sure that we provide an appropriate clearance to accommodate those. This lab edge detail is, is very important. Um, because they can be very finicky details and they require a lot of coordination with the facade as well as with the architectural considerations. There's often a lot of cost associated with these slab edge details and relatively minor architectural and structural differences can have substantial effects on the constructability of the system. So for these reasons, we need to think about the slab edge early in the project and, and give it some fairly serious thought. There are a number of factors that are going to influence the slab edge design. And they include things like the type of the facade system and its weight, its location with respect to the spandrel beam, in other words, the amount of the slab overhang, what capacity in flexure and shear the uh, floor deck or slab has, um, how those loads are amplified or applied, excuse me, and whether we have relatively uh, uniform conditions around the perimeter of the building, or maybe we have five dozen different conditions around the perimeter of the building. Obviously, making the conditions the same around the perimeter makes everyone's life easier and less expensive. There are two fundamental approaches to slab edge design. In the first, uh, the slab or deck is going to cantilever beyond the span we'll be in here, and a cantilever beyond that, and it'll pick up the facade essentially like a cantilever beam. And the slab in this case has to be strong enough to support the facade loads directly acting as a beam and flexure. It needs enough flexural capacity and enough shear capacity. In the second system, the designer cannot or maybe doesn't want to support the facade loads with the slab and flexure and shear, and so the spandrel beam then must be designed to carry the eccentric facade loads taking into consideration the torsion. So if we look at a case like this, as we've talked about before, we have an eccentric facade load. There may be some horizontal component on that slab edge due to, to wind or seismic loads. We have to consider how those get transmitted back into the building structure. And the design guide is going to walk through this process for you. So I won't spend a lot of time talking to you about it here, but I will point out to you that the, uh, when we consider the slab acting as a cantilever beam beyond the spandrel, the dash line is the moment diagram associated with the floor gravity loads, so floor dead and live loads. The solid line is the moment diagram due to the facade loads. So you, as you can see, we get a lot of negative moment 
over the uh, exterior support, and that negative moment doesn't subside very quickly. So we're going to need a fair bit of flexural reinforcement in the top of the slab at the, at the spandrel beam to help resist those uh, flexural loads. Looking at this condition and plan, we might have a condition where we have discrete uh, facade loads on the edge of the slab. How do we distribute those? Well, there's no uh, defective, uh, sorry, definitive reason for doing this. We typically distribute our loads at SGH on a one-to-one -one slope back to the spandrel beam. Now, notice that this gives us two different effective widths for the uh, slab edge and flexure and shear. At the exterior edge of the slab, a spandrel beam, excuse me, the uh, effective width <clears throat> is relatively narrow. By the time we get to the inboard edge, it's a lot wider. One thing to point out to you here is that the flexural capacity in the area beyond the spandrel beam is likely to be different than it is on the inboard side. And that's because here we probably have a bent plate pour stop or maybe a light gauge metal pour stop and a solid concrete slab. Once you get to the inboard side of the spandrel beam, however, we're going to have floor deck. That deck may be running left to right on the page or up and down. And the orientation of that deck has a big effect on what the flexural capacity of, and shear capacity of that slab are on the interior side of the spandrel beam. The design guide includes a number of tables for flexural capacities of floor slabs for a variety of thicknesses and deck orientations and concrete strengths as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one thing to note here is that we always use uh, uh, a 615 bar or a 706 bar in our slabs rather than welded wire fabric because the welded wire fabric tends to get pushed down to the top of the uh, uh, composite floor deck where it does little good in resisting the negative moments. So we always use uh, a deformed bar in our slabs. I'm sure many of you have seen this. This is uh, from the Steel Deck Institute's uh, manual. It's the uh, guide for selecting pore stops given a, a slab overhang. But on exterior slab edges, quite often the, uh, the slab edge is well beyond the 12 inch limit here that this table is good for. And so in the design guide, we've included a table for bent plate pour stops for uh, extensions up to 18 inches from the spandrel beam. So we hope you'll find this useful. Now, when the, the, uh, the facade itself doesn't bear on the slab, but rather attaches to the, uh, the pour stop, we probably want to use a bent plate there rather than a light gauge metal pour stop. We want something that you can weld to readily. And we also needed to get the forces from that vertical edge of the slab back into the slab. And the way we typically do that is by using a, a headed uh, stud or using a deformed bar anchor that gets welded to the uh, vertical leg of the pour stop. <clears throat> One thing to note here is that the headed studs that I'm indicating here with the pointer uh, must be um, typically field applied unless the bent plate comes uh, after the steel framing is already erected. And the reason for that is if the bent plate comes with the spandrel beam and the studs on it, the studs pose a tripping hazard to the steel workers erecting the spandrel beam. So these will often be field applied. The design guide also includes some design aids for determining the uh, tensile and shear capacities of headed studs and the edges of slabs. So we hope you find these useful too. <clears throat> so that was all to deal with approach one for the uh, slab acts as a cantilever beam. Approach two deals with the uh, slab not resisting the loads as a cantilever beam. In this case, the spandrel beam has to take the eccentric facade loads. And of course, those facade loads are eccentric to the spandrel beam, and they will impose not only vertical loads in the spandrel beam, but a twist due to the eccentricity. So how do we deal with that twist? Most commonly, we'll add a kicker or something like that, and that kicker might be double angles or single angles or a channel that braces the bottom flange of the beam up to the next interior beam and helps resist that twist. One thing to notice, though, is that we have to design our slab to take the horizontal component, FHK, uh, of the kicker force. 
So the slab is an integral part of this system. If you have light roof deck here, you might want to consider adding a strut between the top flanges of the beams to take that horizontal force rather than relying on the slab or the or, uh, metal roof deck. <clears throat> Something that we commonly do at SGH is to provide a roll beam instead of a kicker. And this is just a wide flange beam uh, attached to a full depth stiffener plate in the spandrel beam. And that connection that I just circled has to be able to resist the twist imposed by the eccentric facade loads. In addition to this, uh, this twist, this, the roll beam is going to impose a vertical load down on the spandrel beam. So we have to make sure we design the spandrel beam for the vertical reaction of the roll beam. <clears throat> Something else to point out here is that quite often steel erectors might prefer to use a slotted uh, hole in the connection of the roll beam to the spandrel beam. That's fine uh, as long as the uh, Faying surfaces between the spandrel beam web and the uh, stiffener plate are prepared for uh, slip critical friction resistance and the bolts are pre-tensioned in order to resist this moment MRB. Another thing to point out here too is that provided the uh, floor deck is spanning left to right on the page, we quite often will drop the top flange of the roll beam to prevent having to cope out the flanges on the top side where they attach to the spandrel beam and the first interior beam. <clears throat> In terms of uh, designing slab edges, the design guide has a number of, of detailed design examples in it that I won't go through today, but they're there for your reference, so I encourage you to take a look through those. And let's move on to talking about steel spandrel beams. Designing a steel spandrel beam is a lot more than picking a wide flange shape <clears throat> that meets the flexural and stiffness criteria which come directly out of our design software. We need to consider whether the beam is going to be composite or non-composite, whether it's part of a moment frame and therefore has lots of extra stiffness, or whether there's any weak axis bending load imposed on the spandrel beam. We need to think about how the beam deflects and when it deflects. <clears throat> Pre-composite deflection under the dead load case <clears throat> is likely to uh, not really affect our facade system at all. All that deflection will have taken place before we come anywhere near installing the facade system. However, any, any loads that are applied to that spandrel beam after the facade is in place or while the facade is being installed will affect it. And those include the live loads. Floor vibrations typically won't influence the design of our spandrel beam. There's enough fa facade load and uh, damping at the spandrel beam to really not make it that much of a consideration. <clears throat> we also need to think about torsion. As we've talked about already, the uh, facade load is likely to be eccentric to the spandrel beam. And if we don't design the slab as a cantilever beam projecting beyond the spandrel beam, the spandrel beam must be loaded in torsion. How does that torsion get resolved at columns? How do we uh, deal with the warping normal stresses associated with that torsion? Also, as the spandrel beam rotates under the torsional load, how does that affect the point where the facade is attached? So we call that a projected translation of the facade attachment point. So these are all things we need to deal with. When it comes to the connection, to the column, what does that look like? Does it need to resist only vertical loads? Do we need to have special non-standard connections to deal with torsion? What about horizontal forces imposed by wind loads in the facade? Some other considerations for our spandrel beam design are the depth of the section, its flange width, can that flange fit within the uh, edge of slab that the architect has planned on? How thick is the flange? Is that flange thickness uh, suitable for welding our headed studs to and for making our facade attachments to? And are we being consistent in our beam depth throughout the project? We at SGH often like to use very similar size spandrel beams throughout the project to make it consistent and make the facade attachment regular throughout the project. 
Remember that a net savings in tonnage may not save the headaches and heartburn of trying to figure out the facade support conditions at two dozen different spandrel beam types throughout the building. Another thing to consider is where is the spandrel beam with respect to the column line? Do we need to offset the spandrel beam from the column line in order to minimize the facade eccentricity? That might be one strategy for dealing with torsion, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, if you do offset the beam from the column line, what do those connections look like? How are you communicating what those connections look like to the steel detailer and the fabricator? <clears throat> We've already talked a little bit about deflection criteria, and this is uh, exceptionally important for spandrel beams. So we need to not deal with just the vertical deflection of the spandrel beam under the load from the facade and from the floor systems. We also need to think about how that spandrel beam rotates under the torsional loads due to the uh, eccentric facade. So in this case, if the beam rotates through an angle theta, the point where the facade is supported is going to displace vertically downward. We call that a, a, a uh, projected translation. That point is also going to displace to the left. We have another projected translation. And all of those things need to be considered in designing the facade. Are we going to be able to accommodate that with the facade system? So what are the torsional loads on the spandrel beam? Well, it's not just going to be the facade load itself, which we've already said is eccentric, but it's going to be the backup system behind the facade, particularly if you have something like a masonry veneer system. You might have CMU block on the edge of your slab that's going to tend to uh, twist your spandrel beam, and you may have some CMU that's on a plate on the back side of the uh, relieving angle in the area that I'm circling here with the uh, pointer. That's going to cause a twist on the spandrel beam. You'll also have wind loads in and out of the plane of the wall that affect the design of the hangar and affect the design of the spandrel beam. So clearly, the rotation of the spandrel beam is something that we need to take into consideration. We need to consider delta VRB, the vertical projected translation due to rotation, and delta HRB. Obviously, your typical spandrel beam isn't going to, to just rotate as much as we've drawn here in this slide. It exaggerates it, but it's something we need to consider. How do we deal with this? Well, one solution might be to put a kicker at every single hanger. Now, this is probably uneconomical. I certainly wouldn't advocate for it, but it's one way that you could deal with it. And if you did this and put a kicker at every hanger for the facade system, you don't have any torsion in the spandrel beam. But it's probably not a very economical solution. So what can we do about that? Well, we could put kickers at selected locations along the span, as you see here, and then design the spandrel beam between those kickers for the torsion. Another thing we could do in lieu of using kickers is using roll beams. Here we show one, but we could have multiple roll beams along the span that perform essentially the same function. They restrain the torsion of the spandrel beam and reduce the effective torsion length of the spandrel beam. Okay, so we've got a condition now where we have to design for some, but not a lot of torsion in the spandrel beam. How do we go about doing that? Well, AISC's Design Guide 9 deals with just the subject. It deals with torsion. It, it's really based on uh, shapes rotating about their center, which I don't think we really have in this case. AISC's Design Guide number 9. Another thing that you could do is use the uh, flexural analogy. Um, this is a, a well-known method. Um, it's published in a number of good texts like Salmon and Johnson. It's relatively easy to implement in the spreadsheet. And in this case, we take the moment, the torsional moment on the beam, divide it by the beam's height, H, and develop a force couple, F, at the top and bottom flanges. And so we design half of the spandrel beam for a weak axis load, F. And we can use that to determine the warping normal stresses in the spandrel beam. The problem with this is that, particularly for long torsional spans, the solution is grossly conservative. So we probably need to find something that's a little more reasonable to design our spandrel beam. Both the AISC design guide and the flexural analogy, as I mentioned, assume the spandrel beam rotates about its centroid. But for a beam supporting a floor slab or even a roof deck, 
beam is not going to rotate about its centroid. In fact, you're going to get some combination of the slab or roof deck flexing and the beam rotating. We quite often idealize that by assuming that the slab just restrains uh, translation of the uh, beam and that the beam has a pin at the uh, center of the top flange and it rotates about that pin. Now you could, if you really wanted to, try to figure out the interaction between the slab and the beam flange and the beam web and try to compute what the effective rotation of the system is. But we don't really recommend that you do this. It's probably not worth the effort. <clears throat> and we can get a relatively good solution by assuming that the beam is pinned at the top and rotates about that pin. So we get these projected translations delta VRB and delta HRB. Again, if we were using the modified flexural analogy, we assume that the beam is pinned at the top and we get this, uh, we resolve the uh, moment on the beam, the torsional moment, into a force couple F at the top and at the bottom. The force couple F is transmitted directly into the slab. Force couple F at the bottom uh, loads the uh, bottom flange of the beam in weak axis flexure. Well, this seems like a pretty good way uh, if, if it works. It's relatively easy to implement in the spreadsheet uh, and you get relatively reasonable rotations out of it. So how can we be sure that this actually works, that this is a viable solution? Well, one thing we did as we were preparing the design guide was to do some finite element studies where we compared a, the modified design guide 9 method, by that I mean using design guide 9, but assuming that the beam rotates about the center of its top flange, and using the modified flexural analogy where again we break that torsional moment into force couples and apply a lateral force at the bottom flange of the beam. And we looked at a number of different loading conditions and we looked at a number of different torsional spans. And here's the good news. Uh, when you look at relatively short torsional spans on the range of 10 to 15 feet, the warping normal stresses and rotations that you get using the modified flexural analogy are even closer to the finite element method than using the modified design guide 9 method. So in summary, you can look in Appendix A of the design guide and see our work there, uh, but the modified flexural analogy for relatively short torsion spans, 10 to 15 feet where you might locate roll beams, uh, is a very good approximation for the results we got out of the finite element study. Now there are some locations where we just have to deal with torsion. We can't put in a roll beam or a kicker. A good example of that might be an atrium or a stairwell with a facade supported directly on the span roll beam. So how do we deal with conditions like that? Well, one of my favorite ways to do it is by plating the back side of the span roll beam by adding a plate to that wide flange beam and effectively making a tube out of it, putting this plate over the length of the span uh, that is uh, laterally unbraced. Alternatively, we could replace the wide flange with a tube, but that also makes making the uh, facade connection detail a little bit different than it is everywhere else in the building. There are many good examples in the design guide here today, but while and seeing how uh, they work. So step back. Uh, we have the fundamentals of envelope design. Talked about the criteria we need to develop the design of the facade system. We've talked about the responsibility uh, and tolerance and the importance of accommodating those tolerances with clearances. And uh, we've talked about slab edge design and family design. So we near about 10 minutes left. Uh, and uh, we'll probably have time just to go through Mason and wall systems, and you'll have the slides uh, that go to all types uh, for your reference. So the cross design of the brick veneer Alec? includes the addition of the movement. Alec. Alec, this is Brent. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're having an audio problem Brent? again. Alec, can you... Uh, just do a, a quick check on your headset there. Please go ahead, Mr. Zimmer. <laughs> 
Thank you. I apologize uh, to, to all for the, uh, the lost uh, connection. I hope you can hear me now. Brent, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do you want to? Do you want to? Okay. Do you want to roll back to 129, please? 129. Okay. Yeah. I think that's about the time we started to break up with you. Okay. My apologies. You can hear me okay now, though, right? Yes. Okay. So when we are dealing with uh, cases where we have to deal with torsion, one of my preferred solutions is to keep the spandrel beam stay at the opening and apply a plate on the back side of the spandrel beam to effectively create a tube-like section uh, over the, uh, the opening at the atrium or the stairwell. Alternatively, we can replace the uh, wide flange with a uh, hollow structural section, but I, I usually prefer to do the detail I'm showing on the left. Uh, there are a number of examples in the design guide that go through the design of spandrel beams, so I won't take the time to do that now. Uh, I see that we have about eight minutes left, uh, so let's move into talking about masonry cavity walls. Uh, my guess is that uh, uh, we won't have time to make it through the other wall systems. We'll just have time to do masonry cavity walls today. Alec, before we move on, we do have a quick question. Uh, go back yeah. to 129 again. 129, okay. Yeah, the question was, uh, what are your thoughts about using a C-channel at the bottom of the steel spandrel beam? Uh, I think that would be useful in resisting uh, weak axis moments, but it's not going to do a whole lot to help you resist torsion. Uh, really, resisting torsion with a closed section of some sort, whether you make it by plating the back side of the wide flange beam or you use a hollow structural section is probably the preferred way to go, unless you can convince yourself that by adding a channel to the bottom flange you develop enough stiffness by using the modified flexural analogy that, that you're going to be okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. So moving on to masonry cavity walls, I'm going to skip ahead to slide 132, which is where we left off. Um, proper design of the brick veneer includes consideration of the movement joints because all brick is going to grow and the facade must be able to accommodate the movement lest it looks like any of these facades with the sealant bulging out of the joints. Typically, the joints are going to be located uh, at the window jams. You'll end up with a vertical sealing joint here, and you'll end up with a joint at the window head. The architect is going to be responsible for determining where those joints should be located and how they're going to be sealed, but the structural engineer record needs to be involved in that process and needs to give the architect an idea of how much the structure is going to deflect and perhaps how much the brick is going to grow and that's all very important in setting the size of the sealant joint. Here's a view of some movement joints in the brick. I'm skipping ahead to this sort of theoretical wall section and elevation. This is for a case where we might have intermittent punched windows in the facade. In this case, we're going to put a shelf angle at the head of the windows where I'm showing here with the red dots. You have a continuous shelf angle at this location here, as you can see here in the, uh, in the section. That shelf angle is supported by brackets and a hanger that come down from the spandrel beam. We show two different types of bracing for that spandrel beam, a roll beam on top and kickers on the bottom. Another type of wall system that you might encounter is a strip window. In this case, the shelf angle also needs to be located at the window head. But one thing that you can do here is run the backup system by the slab edge. You pull the slab edge back and allow the backup system to run by. Otherwise, it's very similar to the condition we just looked at with the punched windows. When you have punched windows, you have the option of locating the uh, shelf angle at the window head as we talked about or locating it directly on the slab edge. If you can locate it directly on the slab edge, you'll save yourself a lot of cost in terms of hardware and field fit up, um, but you will have to use a loose lintel, as I'm showing here, that spans over the window opening and bears on the brick on either side of the window jam. Now in that case, it's important that the loose lintel not be rigidly attached to the backup. We want the loose lintel to move with the brick around it. When we consider the uh, movements 
of the uh, structure due to the brick load and how, we, how that affects the joint, we need to consider the vertical deflection of the spandrel beam. We need to consider the rotation of the spandrel beam and the associated projected translations due to the rotation. We need to think about the rotation and deflection of the shelf angle itself that occurs between the hangers. We need to think about how much the brick grows due to moisture and temperature. And if it's a tall building, we may need to consider shortening of the columns in the bottom stories of the building. Uh, so in that case, we need to consider all of those vertical movements together. And those vertical movements combine to help you determine what the effective soft joint size needs to be. Most joint filler materials have the compressibility or extensibility of plus or minus 30% of the original size of the joint. So in other words, you can re reduce the joint by about a third. Some joint fillers can go as high as 50%. I'm working on a project right now where the, the joint can be compressed to 50% of its original size. But again, this is something over which the architect is going to have control and the structural engineer record typically won't. And there's a good example in the design guide, example 7.1, that goes through the process of determining what an appropriate soft joint size might be based on the uh, compressibility of the sealing material. As we've already talked about, we need to consider in-plane movements of the wall. Uh, typically, in a uh, masonry veneer system, the uh, masonry panel will displace with the lower floor on which it's supported for gravity loads. Uh, Brent, you've just sent me a message. You're asking me to mute my audio. No, I'm sorry. That's not for you. Okay, thank you. We'll keep going. So typically, the, the masonry will displace with the uh, lower floor, which is supported for gravity loads, and will accommodate interstory drift through uh, shearing of the soft joint floor above. We also need to think about how the backup system is laterally supported at the uh, upper floor, at the upper portion of the story. As you see in the detail on the left, you have a CMU backup wall that's connected to the beam web with a grip stay channel and an anchor. Well, the backup wall is going to have wind loads and seismic loads in it, and that means the spandrel beam is going to need to be designed for weak axis bending between points of restraint like columns and, and roll beams or kickers. In the case of the detail on the right, the top of the backup wall is captured between two plates, and any wind load that is uh, applied to this backup wall it may cause a twist and uh, weak axis bending of the spandrel. So those are things to keep in consideration when you design the spandrel. We also need to think about where the hangers are going to be located in plant. Dealing with things just in section can be kind of short-sighted. You need to think about where the hangers are going to be located along the length of the facade and also what happens when you get to corners. Do you need to provide hangers that are attached directly to the column? Or is your relieving angle capable of, of cantilevering beyond the last hanger on the beam and coming out to the corner? Things to keep in mind. This is sort of a uh, prototypical detail that we use on our projects a lot when we have masonry veneer system. I won't go through all the details here. The design guide goes through this in some, some level of detail. I will, however, point out a couple of things. First of which is that we are providing erection bolts in long slotted horizontal holes in the angle, sorry, uh, in the stiffener plate. And uh, I guess the vertical slotted holes are in the stiffener plate and horizontal slotted holes are in the angle. The idea here is that we allow for good field fit up. We allow for some adjustment of where this hanger is going to be located. And then when its location is finally set, we come back and we field weld that hanger into position uh, just before the brick goes up. Uh, it's possible to use slip critical bolts in this case in lieu of the field welds. You just need to make sure the bolts are good for the load. Another place that we allow for some adjustment is down here in the connection of the uh, shelf angle to the hanger. In that case, we might use a vertical long slotted hole in the uh, leg of the hanger and a uh, erection bolt. Once the location is set, then we, then we come back and we touch up the, uh, we add a field weld to the top of the shelf angle. 
we probably want to remove that erection bolt because that erection bolt is going to get in the way of any flashing or waterproofing that comes down where I'm tracing with my cursor now and exits the wall. Another thing to point out here is that we always galvanize our relieving angles. And that even though they're behind the water barrier of the building, uh, any water that makes it behind that barrier, perhaps through a gap in the flashing or a joint in the flashing, will, is going to collect on the shelf angle and may rust it out if we don't properly protect it. So we always galvanize our shelf angles. The design guide has a uh, table which I think will be of some use to you. Um, it's for designing shelf angles and it's based on the paper by uh, Tide and Krogstad. Um, and it's uh, for sizing shelf angles based on thickness, uh, leg length, the spacing uh, between attachments, which could be hangers, uh, and for the vertical height of bricks supported. So I hope that will be of some use to you. Brent, I see that we're at uh, 3.02 by my watch. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is uh, stop here and uh, leave the remaining slides uh, for reference, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Okay. We do have one question right now. Um, okay. The question is this. Does, does the design guide take into account thermal bridging? And if not, is this something you consider when designing these connections? And do you have any examples or advice for such considerations? Yeah, thermal bridging certainly is a consideration. Um, and it's something that we do take into consideration. I think one thing that we try to do is, is to keep parts that are likely to be cold um, at least galvanized so that if we do collect any moisture on them through condensation, uh, that it doesn't create a durability problem for us. Um, typically, the, uh, the envelope designer, which is usually the architect, will take into consideration thermal bridging. But you're right, you will have some thermal bridging, particularly through the, um, the relieving angle. Fortunately, those are relatively small areas. You know, you're not having thermal bridging everywhere. It's probably going to be in the case of the brick system at the hangars. We don't usually put in a plastic shim on the back side of the relieving angle to hangar connection to try to break that thermally. Uh, we, we feel that using a plastic shim there is inappropriate. Other questions, Brent? Um, I don't believe we have any other questions at this time. Okay. So with that, I'd uh, like to thank you all for listening in um, and just remind you of the, the key takeaways uh, from the presentation today. Uh, the first is that the design team needs to develop a clear strategy for attaching the facade and the structural engineer of record has a very important role to play in developing that attachment strategy and then reviewing the documents when they come back uh, from a specialty structural engineer responsible for the design. Currently, ASCE 7 and IDC have some explicit criteria for facade attachments, uh, especially for seismic loads, which we talked about briefly, and that the facade attachment strategy that the design team chooses is going to have a big impact on what the slab edge looks like and the design of the fan will be. So thank you very much, and Brent, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Alec. Yeah, we've, we've actually got one more question, and I'd, I'd like you to address it if you would, please. Um, sure. The, the comment in question is this, that in your presentation you mentioned vibration damping in the beams. And can you, can you please expand on this, uh, this topic a little bit? Sure. Uh, quite often when we design uh, hospitals or uh, laboratory facilities that have uh, strict vibration criteria, we try to make sure that beams that are in the center of the bay uh, meet the occupant's vibration needs. In other words, if you have bench microscopes or uh, sophisticated surgical equipment, we make sure that our beams have the appropriate natural frequency uh, that those vibrations aren't going to affect work going on in the building. When you get out to the spandrel beam of the building, and you have a whole lot of uh, interior finishes on it as well as the mass associated with the facade. Uh, in those cases, we're typically not that worried about vibration on the facade, uh, sorry, on the spandrel beam. Uh, so we don't usually spend a lot of time considering that unless it has, uh, the building has very, very stringent vibration criteria. Okay, great, thank you.
And then another question we have. Go ahead. Uh, what would you recommend for loose lintels that are at vertical control joints? Uh, in terms of what size they are or in terms of the, uh, uh, the joint itself, I, I guess we typically um, try to keep the vertical leg of the loose lintel near the back face of the masonry. Uh, and, the question uh, is at the joint, the joint itself. Oh, at the joint itself. Okay. So you have a vertical joint that's very close to the loose lintel, right? We typically design loose lintels so that the brick arches over the, uh, the loose lintel to some extent, so we aren't designing the loose lintel for a uniformly distributed load. We actually end up designing the loose lintel for sort of a triangular load. Uh, if you put a vertical control joint within that triangle of load, you uh, effectively eliminate the brick's ability to arch. So what we typically tend to do is recommend that the loose lintel, uh, sorry, that the vertical joint be located um, a brick or at least half a brick beyond the edge of the opening. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, I believe it does. Um, yeah, we, how, how we often tend do you to make sure the, the vertical joint is not within the loose lintel span. Yeah, I was going to say, how often do you have the opportunity to, to move the joint? <laughs> Depends on how good a negotiator you are with the architect, I believe. Right, got you. Okay, and then uh, we'll, we'll end with this question. It's a historical question, if you will. Uh, oh. this, person, this person says they've worked on several buildings from the 60s and 70s where the horizontal soft joint was not installed under the shelf angle. Can you comment on the history of this detail? Or have you come across it? Uh, yeah, I have come across it in a few cases where uh, one building I'm thinking of in particular was built in 62 and in 66. It was built in stages. And <clears throat> it had a brick veneer with sort of a nominal cavity behind it. And uh, without much room, below the uh, relieving angle. In other words, the relieving angle was built pretty much tight to the brick beneath it. You actually end up with a case where the brick below the angle can grow so much that you actually start jacking up on the relieving angle. In this particular case, it was starting to lift the masonry parapet on the building. Uh, so uh, it's certainly not a, a detail that we endorse by any stretch. Um, we, we tried to get away from that. And in cases where we may need to do a retrofit of the building, we may try to uh, remove that course of brick right below the relieving angle and uh, put in a slightly shorter brick and put in a uh, replacement sealant joint below the shelf angle, assuming the, the wall is properly flashed. Okay. Thank you very much, Alec. I appreciate your uh, addressing those questions, and thanks for a great presentation.